This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. From time to time, we're going to catch up with the people who have shared their story on the show. Last time we caught up with Lauren Murdoch, she had left Sydney, spent time in quarantine, and was starting to work as a chef on a cattle station in the Northern Territory. Well, she's still working there, but currently stuck in Western Australia in a lockdown. Lauren, how are you doing over there? I'm marvellous, thank you, Ant. <laughs> well, you uh, escaped the Northern Territory for a break. You were actually planning on coming to Sydney and those plans got scuppered. Can you tell us about what's what's been happening? Um, yes, so I had booked to come home to Sydney for Christmas and surprise my family. They thought that I was coming home in February. And then when the shit started to hit the fan and towards the end of December, I kind of got this feeling that it wasn't going to happen. It probably wasn't very safe for me to go. Um, and I actually had to do this really big plan to get to Sydney because my sister had my house keys and another friend of mine had my car. So I had to make up a lie that my friend needed to get my, the house keys to get the cookbooks, the borrow some cookbooks or something. So my sister was like, yeah, cool, that's fine. Um, and then when my sister thought that I wasn't coming home in February, she said, I don't think you're going to make it home. And I said, well, I've actually got to let you know that I was coming home in December and surprised you all. And I had organised that I was going to be out the front of the house for a Zoom call on Christmas Day. And then, then you know, wow. I know, it was all being set up anyway. It doesn't matter. So I then contacted um, our HR department So and I just didn't know what to do. I didn't really want to stay on the property for a month, even though it would be amazing. Um, there's no one there. It's all sort of packed up at the moment. And, you know, the wet season would be great, but a whole month, I went, I'm not sure. So they said, we might have an idea, a plan for you. So they also own, the people that own the station own Voyager Estate in Margaret River. And they were doing a pop-up for a month out in the garden and they needed a chef. So lucky me, I got to come down here for a month, which has been fantastic. So, yeah, I swapped. Yeah, it was, So I was very clean for a month. There was no red dirt stuck between my toes all the time. <laughs> and I was working in a rose garden. And um, it, was, it was really nice. It was great. I had a great time. How did you feel about um, getting away for a break, having... Um, not being able to go to Sydney and then finding yourself in a lockdown in WA? <laughs> you know what? I'm just rolling with the punches at the moment. It's just, <laughs> just whatever. When it's just going to happen, it's going to happen. So at this stage, I'm staying in a beautiful house on the property. So in, in the actual Voyager estate amongst the vines, which is very nice. And there's an emu that walks past sometimes and some kangaroos and some rabbits and beautiful birds and things. So... I'm pretty lucky and I've been able to get out and do a bit of exercise on the beach every day, but it's a bit cooler today, so I'm not sure if I'll be beaching it today. But I don't know if I can get back to the Northern Territory now because Northern Territory have closed the border to this hotspot. And the, and the irony is if I'd gone to Sydney, I would have been able to get back to the Northern Territory. But now I'm <laughs> now I'm in down here in the hot spot, I've got to wait. So I just don't know. We don't know how I'm getting back or anything at the moment. But, yeah, it, that's, it could be worse things. I'm in a very nice spot, so that's good. When we caught up with you last year, you were just starting the role as a chef on the cattle station. What, what's it been like living there? Do you have any stories you can share? <laughs> I do have a few stories, actually, Ant. Um, it's been great. I've loved it. I've loved the cooking has been great, but it's all the things that I've been doing outside of cooking that I've really enjoyed about being on the property. So I've been mustering quite a few times. There was a day that I did about 15 kilometres on the horse, like um, just walk. So they, they move the cattle quite a lot to get the cattle used to being around people and moving and so they're less stressed out. So I did about 15 k's on the back of the horse and we mustered about, I think it was about 1,000 head of cattle that day um, across a river and stuff. So that was quite amazing. And I've driven trucks and things and, you know, I've had, I've had a really, really good time. It's been very different to what I've normally done the rest of my life. Well, I've known you for many years and you've always uh, find yourself in strange predicaments and come <laughs> and some strange stories emerge. I know you broke down in the middle of the outback at one stage. I did. I did. It was just a dick manoeuvre. I just didn't didn't check the, the fuel gauge, really. It's all that really happened. So I, I think it was one of the first times that I actually left the property 
and I drove to Catherine for a couple of days and I was outside Catherine and I went to Edith Falls and had a swim in Edith Falls and the waterfalls. And on the way back, I kind of noticed that the fuel gauge was getting lower and lower and then it started to cough and splut and, and then eventually just stopped. So I pulled over there and it was about five kilometres outside of town and it took a while for someone to sort of pull up and help me and then they went and got fuel and came back and then he couldn't get it started again. And he was actually an ex-cop, which was quite nice of him to do, stop on his day off. Um, <laughs> And then I had to call the property to say, get a mechanic out. And the mechanic came and the mechanic took apart, you know, the fuel gauge and was, had a cigarette in one hand and the fuel gauge in the other. And I'm just going, I'm sort of hiding behind the door of the, of, the, of the Hilux. But yeah, so yeah, didn't do that again. I bought the, bought the station manager a bottle of, bottle of Jack Daniels. <laughs> As a, I'm very sorry about that. But yeah, so I haven't done it again, which is good. Lots of fuel, fill it up all the time. That's all I've been doing. But, um, yeah, it's been good. It's been good. I've, I've been to the Territory a few times and uh, I've had some experiences with crocs and we always think of crocodiles up in that area. Have you had any close encounters? Um, yes. So that's just before I left, it really started raining a lot and there's a little creek between the homestead and the camp where we live and there was a big, um, about a three-metre crocodile track there, which is pretty close. It's like 200 metres from where we live. Anyway, it's on a river below river so there's crocodiles everywhere and we also have a problem with feral pigs up there and so people have pig dogs and they go hunting um pigs and there was one day just after christmas that they went out pig hunting with the two dogs and the pig swam into the river and the dogs chased the pig into the river and then a crocodile came and ate one of the dogs so I know it was really, uh, it was quite full on. And then, so the dog and the, the other dog and the pig were on the other side of the river and they had to go and get the gun to shoot the pig. So the dog would let go of the pig and swim back across the river, which, which was successful. Oh. And then the next day they got a ping. So the dog that was eaten um, had a tracking device on it. And the next day they got a ping from the tracking device that was obviously still inside the crocodile. No way. <laughs> Yeah, so and then they went to look for it. But you can't you can't kill the crocodiles. So I don't I don't even know if they found it or not. But yeah, that was that was quite a full on like I'm in the Northern Territory now, aren't I? <laughs> so yeah, it was good. There's a, yeah, quite a few things. And buffaloes, there's a few buffalo sort of um wild buffalo are up there as well. We have a few that have sort of become pets but not pets. But there was I don't know if anyway, when I was in lockdown I started running. I'm not sure if you remember that, but I started the first time my life started running it. So when I moved to the property, I started kept running on the airstrip because it's nice and flat and safe. And then one day I was running and a guy came up on the quad bike and said, you've got to jump on the back because there's a big buffalo like 100 metres away from you hiding under the tree. And they'll they'll kill you. They will stomp you to death. And Wow. Know. So that was a bit scary. And I got back to camp and everyone was like, oh, my God, I can't believe that what happened to you. And I was blissfully unaware of the actual <laughs> my life was in serious danger that day and then next day we all jumped in the bull catchers and went and caught went and caught nine of them I think there were around the property very close to the homestead so yeah it was, it was quite interesting little activity so I'm not running anymore <laughs> <laughs> you'd, you'd also talked about how there's um, animals reared on the property and there was um, piglets and um, baby, there was calves and all sorts of things going on. Do, do you have any involvement with that, with your role? Um, yeah, so next to near the homestead is where they keep the potty calves. So the potty calves are the ones that have been rejected by their mothers or whatever to look after. So they need to be fed every day. Um, at one stage, I think we had 20 of them. So that took a quite a bit of, I didn't always help because normally it was, the feeding time was around about time that I was cooking breakfast or, or whatever so I didn't do it as much as I could have but I whenever I could I'd get involved and also there we had um a baby donkey which was really cute his name's Banjo he's still there and a baby buffalo and some piglets so two little piglets that were found orphaned on the property so we I fed them the best scraps that I could possibly feed them. They got the best leftover bits of cake and cream and really ripe fruit and things. And one day, <laughs> honestly, I, I spoiled these pigs and they really loved me. 
And there was a time where the two little pigs ran away. Um, they were gone for a couple of days. Then I guess they probably realised that it was better to be back in the pen with the rest of the animals. And I made them coming home presents. So I made them little ice cream cones with a roast potato in them. And they, <laughs> they, they didn't actually leave after that. They sat there and, you know, they were quite happy to be back, in, back where they get the, the good treats. And then just before Christmas, we butchered them and I did a couple, I did some legs in the shoulder in the smoker. We brined them and then um, in a maple brine and then we did them in the smoker with some cherry wood chips, I think they were. Um, and the rest, you know, were cut up into chops and things and blah, blah. But honestly, that pork, that was some of the best pork I've ever had. I'm not sure if it's because oh, it's been a while between pork, but you know, we all agreed that it was really, really good. They were really quite fatty and delicious and loved in life and death. <laughs> well, when, when I reached out and uh, said, can we catch up? Cause I knew that you were in uh, lockdown over in WA. There was something in, in the message that you sent back to me, which said, oh, we could talk about uh, milking bulls. And I'd sort of just glazed over but I realised it didn't say cows, it said bulls. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah. So that was really quite an experience. This is quite full on, but anyway. It's, so the vet comes every now and then. Well, that's probably not the right word. The vet, the vet, the vet visits um, the property <laughs> to check on the, the, the quality of, of the sperm for the bull and the semen. So... The bulls, the some of our bulls are worth like ten thousand wow. dollars, and they're beautiful animals. They're really amazing, and they're you know between seven hundred and eight hundred kilos. They are massive, and they're they're beautiful. So we have to check their sperm, and so they get the bulls come into the yard, and then they get put into a thing that's called a crush, which sort of gives them in a headlock, and then the vet or someone has a little tiny cup on a stick, and to Milk. <laughs> so weird, even to say this. To milk the bull, it's, you put like this fist-sized probe up their bum, and you hold it there with two handles until the sample comes out. And <laughs> and then, so and I actually looked at the sample, and you can tell the difference. Like some were really, some of the sperm were really strong and swimmy and beautiful tails, and some had crooked tails and were running into the walls and things. So wow. yeah, it was quite interesting and i must say so i milked about 15 bulls and <laughs> yeah it was, I, haven't, I haven't done that before so you know <laughs> it was really that was an experience so yeah so you've been cooking uh down there in wa at voyager estate what's do you know what the plan is at the moment you can't go back to northern territory and um, does it mean lockdown if you try to, or what, what is the plan? Yeah, so if I wanted to go back to Northern Territory now, I would have to go back into quarantine at Howard Springs. So I'm not doing that. Well, I, you know what, I, if I had to, I would, but I'm not really that keen on doing it again. <laughs> but I, at the moment, the plan is to kind of maybe go to Kununurra. I don't know if we can even go to Kununurra because that means we're going into, anyway, taking our hotspot germs up there. Um, so Kununurra is about three hours from our property and that's where we go and do the shopping every week and stuff like that, which is beautiful. Kununurra is actually pretty nice. And I don't know, maybe we'll stay there until the borders open because Northern Territory, I think, actually opened their borders quite quickly if the hotspot's been lifted. Um, so at the moment, I just, I do not know. And I booked a holiday. I'm so I'm on, actually on two weeks annual leave now because I finished work at the estate on Saturday and then I was going to stay here for four days and then I booked four days accommodation down at Denmark and Albany. So I was going to go, you know, to Liberty and stuff. And and then, yeah, and then I have four days still booked at Fremantle. So I booked Fremantle from Monday to Thursday and then I'm still booked to fly to Kununurra on the 12th. We just have to wait now until whatever, <laughs> you know, I don't know. So, yeah, I don't know. I do not know what I'm doing next week at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure there'll be some crazy adventure. And um, as always, love catching up with you, Lauren. Uh, we might um, we might do it again in a couple of months' time. I'm sure there'll be some crazy stories to hear. <laughs> yeah, also, uh, <laughs> I want to tell you about the flight from Kununurra to here. 
um, when I finally left the property on the first, I was on the flight and from Kununurra, and we we just started to accelerate down the runway, and then the plane stopped, and they had an announcement saying that WA Police um, Border Patrol has stopped our plane. Oh my God! So five minutes later, without saying anything, they said due to WA's um, strict policy on coronavirus, you know, um, we think someone on the plane might have come from a hotspot. And just for like a few seconds, I was like, I cannot believe that this is going to happen to me again. I just I almost really lost it then. And then probably they probably had a pause for maybe three seconds, but it felt like five hours. And they said, but we've been given the go ahead to, to take off. So it's fine. And even then when we landed in Perth, they said well, it was a really bumpy landing when those ones where everyone claps that you finally land. And then and then they said, oh, anyone that got on at Kununurra, can they exit the plane first? And anyone that got on, on Darwin, can they please stay on the plane? And even then, up to then, I was thinking, I'm still not there. <laughs> I've still got a chance that I'm going to bloody get locked up again. But um, <laughs> no, and then we went through. So it was like, oh, thank God. Yeah. But then I went to Northbridge also for a night, uh, two nights, um, and that was really full on. So coming from the property with having hardly anyone there for a couple of months, I hadn't left the property, to Northbridge, it was like going to King's Cross 15 years ago. Just absolutely packed. It was the 1st of January. People, I pulled up and there was a drug deal going on outside my taxi. People were off their heads talking to trees and things. And I was just like, this is so full on. I just... It was really quite different, but oh, you know, I've adjusted now. I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we're, we are definitely catching up with you in a couple of months' time. Let's hope your lockdown days are over. Yeah. Um, though they do sound entertaining. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I've, but, I've done all right. I'm not complaining. It's okay. Uh, uh, Lauren, please keep in touch and, um, and we'll catch up with you again soon. Thank you. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>